if anybody is ever wondering or in question about if prayer works, I'm <laughs> sitting right there. Okay. Right there. Today's message is titled, Spiritual Warfare is Not Fair. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's, it's kind of relevant to what we're going through right now, so if everybody can please stand. And uh, let's all read together. Again, the devil took him up on to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, before we get uh, before we get started, I want to do a, a grounding exercise. So, everybody, could please just close your eyes and take a big, deep. Inhale in through your nose and a big deep exhale out through your mouth. Take a big deep inhale through your nose, big exhale out through your mouth. Big deep last inhale through your nose, big deep exhale out through your mouth. Not everybody's grounded, just make sure your feet flat on the ground, you're present here. I want to welcome you back in the service. Not everybody's present, welcome. How y'all doing? All right, all right, all right. All right. So, today's message is titled Spiritual Warfare is Not a Fair War. Today we're going to be speaking about the unfairness of spiritual warfare. And for context, we'll use a few key moments from the Apostle Peter's life. And then we'll cross-pollinate that with the battles some of us may be facing currently today. And by the end of the day, we'll try to arm and equip you for victory over this battle. Keep in mind, this is a fight. This is a fight without swords, without shields, without knives, without guns, but with thoughts, temptation, arrogance, and doubt. It's called spiritual warfare, and make no mistake about it, this is a war. Just three people to tell them this is a war. I said, test it. Don't start on me. <laughs> Three people. <laughs> Three. Come on. Three. So, for context, let me paint this picture now. About the year 2 BC, Peter's born. He was originally named Simon. To Bethsaida. He was born in Bethsaida. It's a small fishing village in Northern Galilee, which is basically now Northern Israel. Uh, he was raised in a community of both Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles being non-Jews, and he also grew up under Roman oppression and taxation. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't no punk. He wasn't no punk. Um, he had grown to become a little arrogant, a little impulsive, a little self-serving, uh, but he also had some deep trust issues. How many people in here got trust issues? Oh, 
on that. <laughs> How many of us have ever let those trust issues transfer into the spirit realm? I was quiet today. Okay. <laughs> okay. How many people have ever had church hurt before? That's a different type of pain. Psalm 118 8 says, It is better to put trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So now let's fast forward. Now Simon Peter is about 25. He's married. He moved to the port city of Capernaum. Simon, a.k.a. Peter, began to catch wind of these revolutionary teachings from this man called John the Baptist, from his brother Andrew. So Peter witnessed John the Baptist actually baptizing Jesus. I mean, just picture that. Just picture that. And he watched Jesus, he watched John the Baptist proclaim that Jesus was the Lamb of God. However, for some reason, Peter was kind of lukewarm about it. He didn't, he, he was just unfazed. He wasn't really moved by this new Jesus movement at the time because he was at war with survival and, and earthly concerns. Some of us, right this very moment, are in a constant tug of war between the desires of our flesh and the will of God. What we want to do versus deep down what we know God is telling us to do. Some of us have been at a constant war with our past, with our family, with our health, with our time, oh my God, our relationships, temptation. Some of us have even been at war with generational curses. We've been at war with fake friends. We've been at war with that annoying person at the job who thinks they're the boss, but they're really not. <laughs> Some of us may try to stay busy and productive just to keep our minds off these wars. But the truth of the matter is, all we're doing is trying to outperform our own trauma. But most of all, this war some of us are fighting is the war within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6 says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all flaming darts from the evil one. See, this war is unfair because our enemy, the devil, specializes in deception and distraction and thrives in the shadows of our minds. But the only way to fight this war is through God's word. But the battlefield is happening not in a city or a fortress, in a castle. Again, it's happening in our minds. And the reason some of us are present here today, worn out, is because you're trying to fight a war with the wrong artillery. Amen. You're trying to fight something spiritual in the natural realm. So now back to Peter. So now picture this. Now here's Jesus walking by the sea. He sees Peter and his brother Andrew. They're throwing their fishing nets into the sea. Jesus comes to them and says, follow me. I'll make you fisher, fishers of men. So Peter and his brother drop their net and began to follow Jesus as one of their, as, as his disciples. During this time, Peter is witnessing Jesus heal the sick from diseases, helping the paralyzed walk again. But for some reason, Peter in his head was still not fully convinced. He may have questioned why Jesus had chose him. It wasn't because of his muscles or his nice shirt, but because he saw potential within him. But like us at times, Peter may have felt inadequate due to the fear and battle of the unknown. Yeah. 
Amen. Peter saw all these blessings and miracles being performed, yet he still had doubt. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you need faith over fear. So at this point, Jesus just got done feeding 5,000 people. After that, he sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee in a boat while he himself stayed behind and prayed. Now, while they were on the boat in the middle of the water, a storm erupted, leaving the disciples a little bit you know, terrified in the boat. Now, while they were in the boat in the middle of the storm, they saw a figure walking on the water. They think it's a ghost. So Jesus, you know, he could sense how scared they were. He told them in the middle of the storm and reassures them. He says, don't be afraid. It's me. So then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, <laughs> tell me to come to you on the water. This is what Peter says. He tells Jesus, if you're really you, tell me to come to you on the water. So here's Peter at war in his own mind, battling with fear, doubt, questionable faith, and uncertainty, divided by the reality of his current circumstances in the midst of a storm. Jesus told him, come. Amen. But isn't it funny how when we're in a storm or at war in our minds, we can still ask God, for help through the storm. But when God calls us to do his bidding, we're too busy. We're too worried about what people are going to be paralyzed to do his will. Or we're just being preoccupied with nothing. Acting like we're busy. You be at home, be at home, flipping through Instagram and Facebook, smoking, drinking, overthinking, sitting and laying around. Peter number one says, therefore prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Yeah. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here, Peter gets out of the boat and begins to walk on water. Yes. But even though he's being blessed with what he asked for, the battle in his mind resurfaces again. And fear and doubt quickly overtook him. When his focus shifted from Jesus to the magnitude of his storm, he began to sing. How many of us have been so fatigued from the battle of the storm we're in that our focus has been more locked on getting out of that storm instead of taking the hand of God, which is much more difficult Listen, while we're focused on moving past the situation, God is more focused on our spiritual orientation. Tell three people, God, my God is mighty and I ain't scared of no storm. In the flesh, we do not war according to flesh, for the weapons are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And also, this, you know, this is just a side note. Jesus is not moved by our anxiety. And I don't mean that in a, in a mean way. But <laughs> Jesus is moved by our faith. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is moved by our faith. Amen. So now here's Peter desperately crying out for the Lord because he's sinking now. Save me, Lord, save me. Save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reaches out and saves Peter. With compassion, though. With compassion. What did Jesus say? 
Oh yeah, little fan. Why did you doubt me? Why would you doubt? Again, like I said earlier, Peter had seen, he bear witness to this man performing miracles, healing the sick, and he still doubted. See, what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, we can become so busy at war in our minds that we end up drowning in our own storms. We take our time all the time. And the one that enemies, man, oh my God. This is the way that the enemy tries to distract us. That's the number one tool or tactic in warfare or in politics is distraction. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Let me ask you something. How many times has God rescued you in the past?
How many times has your spirit said, God, I will do better? I will give you more, but your flesh keeps you in a constant battle with him. You see, the moral of this story is once the enemy saw that Peter was beginning his walk with Christ, at every single spiritual milestone, he attacked his mind. The devil understood the assignment Peter did. The enemy's objectives are always to distract, create confusion, deplete you, sow division, so that you have to second guess yourself, so that you're at war with yourself. But most importantly, his chief goal is to break your faith and your belief in God. Be mindful. The enemy is always, the enemy will always come when there's a stage. What do I mean by a stage? A stage is a temporary circumstance. From here on out, when you're hit with that temporary circumstance, just know that God is with you. Say it, say God is with me. Once you submit, repent, and fully give your life to God, your faith cannot be conditional. It must be unshakable, immovable, and everlasting. But we also need to practice how we talk back to the enemy when he attacks our mind. When doubt creeps in, just tell the enemy, not today, Sam. Now you say it. Not today, Sam. Second Thessalonians. But the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So when fear kicks in, you tell the devil, get beneath me, Satan. I know my God is in control. Now your turn. Get beneath me, Satan. I know my God is in control. There you go. And I guarantee you, when you leave here, it will happen. But if you don't have a protocol, if you're not used to speaking back to the devil, sometimes when he whispers in your ear, you won't know what to do. So Mark 16, verse 17 says, and these signs will accompany those who believe in, who believe in my name. They will drive out demons and they will speak new tongues. So when you hear the enemy telling you you're nothing, you're never going to make it. Tell him the devil is a lie because my father in heaven already proclaimed. So let's repeat after me. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. Because my father in heaven already proclaimed. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So, you know, when we when we may slip, when he slips into our ears and tell us that we'll never elevate past our current circumstances, and I know there's some people just felt like I will never get any further than where I am. How many people have felt like that? Yeah. Well, you tell them my God told me this battle is already won. And you may wish you were God, but you are not God. In fact, you are the answer to God. Your power is limited, and my God is mighty and everlasting. That's how you got to talk back to the devil. So my call to action is, I want us to win this spiritual war because the enemy fights dirty, and we need to be ready. So how can we overcome these mental battles? We have to put on that armor of God. 
Ephesians 6, 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the attacks of the devil. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray. 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 If you want to hear them, pray. Prayer is our direct line to God. Through constant communication, we seek his guidance and strength to resist temptations. Also, stay grounded in scripture. The Bible is our weapon. By immersing ourselves in God's word, we renew our minds and find inspiration to live according to God's will. Also, we need to seek fellowship. We need to seek fellowship from other believers. Surround yourself with believers or even get a spiritual mentor. There's nothing wrong with that. I got one. I got a couple. You know, you need the church body to help you out with this walk. You should never feel like you're alone in this walk because that's when the enemy will come. Look at this. You all by yourself. No, reject that. One last thing about Peter. Peter's betrayal stemmed from two key factors in spiritual warfare. It was overconfidence. Peter underestimated the enemy's power and his own weakness. He relied on his own strength and declarations, leaving an opening for temptation. Also, Peter also suffered from a lack submission. True strength comes from God, but Peter hadn't fully submitted his will and emotions to God's control. That's where he messed up, and that, my friends, is where I don't want us to mess up. That is why this, I'm going to tell you again, this is a war. Some of us are at war right now while I'm speaking. So you know that this is real. You need to learn how to talk back to the enemy. Get in your word. And one last thing, Pastor, we love you. Thank you.